And take your Bible out and turn to the book of Hebrews. We're in the book of Hebrews. Before we uh, get going there, Hebrews chapter 7, I just wanted to uh, tell you that uh, last night uh, there was a concert at the fair, Cutlass. I got to see the last song uh, because I was in the KGRB booth. And in the KGRB booth, it was called Stump the Pastor. And uh, only one person stumped the pastor. There were two of us. Uh, me and uh, Jeff, and then me and uh, Ed, and then me and... I can't remember his name. That's with a K. Anyway, not a, it's not a usual name that you hear. Cor Corvin or something like that. Anyway, but uh, he asked the question... Um, see if, oh, Kyle left, because he would know this. How long did it take for Noah to build the ark? And I was like, oh, man, I can't remember that number. But uh, we're really not sure. Maybe 120 years was the answer. But it was, that's the one we couldn't pull out. But uh, they asked some difficult, difficult questions down at the fair. Some of them were, uh, you know, the first one we, we didn't really answer because he left. But he was like, uh, does God like redneck country? I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> but, oh. Oh, yeah, you guys like redneck country? Okay, all right, that works for me. But uh, they asked some really difficult questions. Um, they asked some, some questions. Uh, let's see if I can name some of the questions. We had an atheist come up, and she asked me, who made God? That's a typical question you get, right? You don't know the answer to it? Uh, did, you know, we answered, she seemed to be somewhat satisfied with our answer. <coughs> And, you know, here's a, here's a girl who told us that uh, she wasn't a church-going girl. She wasn't so much interested in Christianity because uh, somebody uh, pressured her when she was younger in church. They pressured her to conform. They pressured her to believe. They, they just kind of said, you know, you have to believe our way. And, and so that pressure, you know, God doesn't do that to us. Well... If he does, it's his business, right? Not, but that's not up for us to do. People need to voluntarily trust Christ as Savior. And uh, this, that was a tough question. Then somebody asked the question, oh, this is really tough. This is not recorded, is it? Okay, here we go. This is the tough question. If a homosexual priest baptized a person, does, it, does that work? Does that baptism work? And... Uh, you know, we are like, okay, so that's interesting. Why are you asking this question? Well, he believed that baptism saves a person. And I, and I, you know, after we talked a while, I said, so, you know, if baptism saves, what we really ought to do is we ought to just start dunking people in the water. Hey, come on over to my house. I'm going to go swimming. Hey, there, I got one. Got it. You know, you know what I'm saying? We could just baptize everybody if bapti baptism saves. Baptism doesn't save. So anyway, I didn't really answer the question for you, but it was a very difficult question. Uh, we were asked other questions, um, questions about Noah, um, questions, just lots of difficult questions. And you see it now I'm stumped. I can't remember what those questions are. But it was really a great opportunity. I really enjoyed it, having the opportunity to be able to sit there. I got to see, uh, let's see, Sean and Shelley came down to visit me and they gave me an easy button. So that was nice, and I only hit that one time during the night because uh, most of the questions were not easy. And then uh, we had Jason and Amber and the kids come down and visit us, and uh, that was a great time. So I don't know, anybody else? I can't remember. But uh, we had a lot of people come through the booth. Um, really great opportunity to be able to just share with people, Christian, non-Christian. Uh, oh, yeah, a Mormon came down. Uh, well, he wasn't, you know, he... He'd been through the Mormon church, and he was very skeptical about all religion. And his question is, you know, he said, man, it seems like every religion is trying to convert me to their religion. And I just don't, you know, how can all these religions be right? And I'm really frustrated with that. He was very frustrated. And I said, well, you know, we're not, I'm not going to try to convert you to our religion. You know, we don't want, we don't care about religion. The most important thing is, that you know Jesus Christ as Savior. If Jesus Christ is who he said he is, if he really lived, if he really died on the cross, if he really rose from the grave, that puts him in a different category than everyone else. It's not about a religion, it's about Jesus Christ. 
people are going to fail you. I'm going to fail you, uh, most likely, but Jesus never failed. So a lot of good questions. So let's uh, turn our focus to um, Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, I want to read a few verses. And I uh, forgot to put them on my notes, so I'll, I'm opening my Bible up today. To uh, he, I, I can, That's right, I got this one too. I got the Bible right here. Forget about that sometimes. Okay. Hebrews chapter 7. And we are looking at a very interesting guy. Melchizedek. You know, how many of you know Melchizedek? The book of Hebrews makes him one of the major stars in the early chapters of Hebrews and says that he's really important. But when you start reading about him, you say, you scratch your head and you say, just who was this guy? Listen, listen as we read. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being trans, you know, the, the name, his name, Melchizedek, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great a man this was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he, whose genealogy is not derived from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Let's stop right there. Lord, we are asking for some wisdom today. Help us to understand what Melchizedek is all about and how he relates to us. And may we uh, just go away here with a better understanding of our relationship to you in Jesus name. Amen. So uh, today as we look at Melchizedek we're actually going to do a, a quick survey of what the main points of this chapter are. We're not going to spend a lot of time looking at Melchizedek today. Sorry to disappoint you but I want you to go home and I want you to read about Melchizedek yourself and see if you can figure him out. Some people think that he was a uh, um, you know, a type of Christ, and certainly he was. Some people think he was the pre-incarnate Christ. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of theories about this guy. It's really interesting. You need to read about him. We'll talk more about that next week. But this week we're going to talk about, we're going to just do a survey of chapter 7 and ask why is Melchizedek in this chapter? What's he trying to teach us? So uh, let me just start out by uh, talking about rules and regulations and rituals. Did you know that there are literally dozens of websites out there dedicated to helping you discover constructive rules for a better life? You probably live your life by a certain set of rules that you've developed. Some spoken, some unspoken, some of them thought through, some of them may be subconscious. You don't even know you're doing it. And... Uh, Here's some of the websites out there. 15 rules to live a happier life. Just 15, that's all it takes. Another one, 16. They added another one on this one. 16 rules to live a successful life. Maybe a little different than happy. 10 rules is the third one. 10 rules to live by for those who want to live a positive life. And then here we go. Here's a good one. 75 rules. Simple life rule. Just 75. And of course, you know, George Washington had to memorize a hundred rules. Did you know that? He had to memorize a hundred rules and his, he was homeschooled. He had to memorize all 100 for, for a, a, living a successful life. And then there were some of them like this. The three simple rules to live by. Now, that's getting a little closer to my style, huh? Simple. Um, 
I counted at least, and I did this, I counted. I went page by page by page, and I counted at least 300 different websites that had similar names. 15, 10, 7, 16, 24, 32, 65, all kinds of, everybody apparently thinks that if you just adopt a couple common sense rules in your life, you're going to be more successful, more happy, and you're going to live a better life. Live by these rules. Now, just what is a rule? A rule is a uh, set of principles governing your conduct or behavior. Here are a few of them. This is a good one. Spend less than you earn. What happens if you don't? No, not good. So, I mean, that's a good rule, right? I like that rule. How about this one? <coughs> Respect other people's property. Is that a good one? Does that happen? Well, so, yeah, it does happen sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. It happens less than, and sometimes when it doesn't, we really notice. How about this one, kids? Maybe parents, grandparents. Clean up after yourself. That's a good rule, isn't it? If you put it down, you pick it up. How about this one? Learn to say no. I don't like that one. Do you? No. I don't like that one. Sometimes you have to learn to say no. Or how about this one? Maybe this is the doctor's one. Do no harm. Do no harm. Work hard for a living. And then there's this one that I read uh, on one of the last blogs. It said, there are no rules. And I thought to myself, what do you mean there are no rules? You just wrote down a rule. If you write down a rule that says there are no rules, we can't believe what you're saying because you wrote down a rule. It's contradictory, right? And then they went, believe it or not, on this particular blog to list 50 different rules to live by. But that was their number one rule. I said, I'm not believing anything these people say because of rule number one. People have always felt the need to make personal rules to live by. Why? Because it's common sense. You need a guiding light. You need guiding principles. You, you want to be more successful. In fact, if you follow certain rules, I don't know if you know this, but your finances can be more successful. In fact, some people give out rules. They say, this is how I became a millionaire. I followed these rules. And they put on these seminars. And if you only pay $10,000, you can learn these successful rules too. And no wonder they're millionaires, right? Because that's one of their successful rules. You shall put on seminars in which everyone pays $10,000. And so that's really good. I like that rule. And, you know, did you know that even God gave us a couple suggestions? They call them the 10 suggestions. Right? No, no, he called these the 10 commandments. He gave them on Mount Sinai, and they are not suggestions. Here they are. I just want to just review them for you. This is kind of the shortened version. You shall have no other gods before me. No other god but me. You shall not make yourself any graven image. No idols. Don't worship any idols. You shall not take the name of your, the Lord your God in vain. But I hear it all the time. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your mother and father. That's one parents always try to teach their kids. Good luck. How's that working for you? Well, it'll work for some of us. Keep it up. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And basically that means you shall not lie. Even in a court of law or out of court of law. You shall not covet. Now the first four of the Ten Commandments relate to our relationship with God. You probably knew that. The last six relate to our relationship with others. And therefore, Jesus could say that all the law and all the prophets are fulfilled in this. You shall love the Lord your God, the first four, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the last six, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do this, and you fulfill all the law and the prophets. These Ten Commandments are, are the backbone of a successful society and a productive life, break them at your own peril. But, let me sound a warning about commandments and rules in general. 
commandments and rules according to chapter 7. We're going to get in there. We're going to discover this. So get your Bible ready. Commandments and rules have one weakness. Rules can't change your heart. They can make you aware that you should do something or not do something, but they can't make you want to do it. And that's the weakness of commandments and the weakness of rules. Should we still have rules? Yes, we should still have rules. Should we still have commandments? Yes, we should still have commandments. But be aware, you have to reach the heart if you want to change the life permanently. Only the gospel has that power to change the life. Today's message can be a, a quick survey of Hebrews 7. We're going to revisit Melchizedek next week to go a little deeper. So let me give you some historical context. Uh, last week we talked about Abraham. You remember that? We talked about the Abrahamic covenant. And we, God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you. And everyone who blesses you, I'm going to bless and everyone who curses you, I'm going to curse. And in you will all the nations be blessed. I told him that. I think it, well, that was Hebrew. That was Genesis chapter 12. He told him that. In Genesis chapter 15, he did this weird ceremony. Remember the strange ceremony where the animals got cut in two, and God went through the center of them, and He said, "I'm going to still bless you, and I'm, this is a promise on based on this the blood oath." that I'm making you based on my own character. So between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, 10 years passed. God promised him you're going to make you a great nation in chapter 12. You're going to have lots of descendants. <laughs> Abraham was 75 years old when he got that promise. He said, man, maybe there's still time for me. Maybe I can still have kids. 10 years later at 85, God made the promise again, and Abraham's thinking, all that Melchizedek, all that my, uh, not Melchizedek, all that uh, my steward, whatever his steward's name was, might live before, uh, you know, make, make him the one. He's got kids. I don't. And God said, no, I'm going to bless you. So 12 and 15, 10 years, right in the middle of those 10 years somewhere, an interesting thing happened. Lot moved away from Abraham and got in trouble at Sodom and Gomorrah. And at one point, Abraham went to battle, went to war with some kings. I think it was like 12 different kings or something. And he rescued Lot. And while he was rescuing Lot, somewhere between 12 and chapter 12 and 15, on the way back, he met this guy named Melchizedek, an obscure and interesting guy in the Old Testament we don't know much about him, but apparently he made such a big impression on Abraham that Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils of war that he captured from the other kings. And now, when you get into the New Testament, what happens is the writer of Hebrews says, by the way, this Melchizedek guy, he's really important. You need to understand him in order to understand God's commandments and promises or you will be left a little confused. Let's see if I can kind of explain to you why that is. Just very quickly. The Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. Hebrew Christians. And they had just come out of Judaism. Where in Judaism... They were steeped in Pharisaicalism and other things like that. You obey the law to the letter. If you obey the law, God blesses you, and you go get to go to his kingdom. If you don't obey the law, you got other problems. But if you don't obey the law, what you have to do is you have to bring a sacrifice to the priest, and the priest will sacrifice the animal, and uh, you know he will say the magic words, and you'll be a o a okay. When you come into Christianity, the whole system, the whole Levitical system, disappears. The commandments and the rituals 
don't hold the same significance to us as they did to the Jews. The significance to the Jews was this. You got to obey the commandments and do the sacrifices in order to get to, to God's kingdom, the heaven. For the Christian, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. The commandments and the rituals can't save you. And that's kind of what Hebrews chapter 7 is all about. So that's the little background of this. And um, so we want to see why Melchizedek is so important to explaining this. Uh, let's go back, to, turn back in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6, verse 19 through 20. The last couple of verses, because they're kind of a transition from chapter 6 to chapter 7. 19 says, this hope, the hope of eternal life, we have an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever after the or according to the order of Melchizedek. And so, if you remember earlier in the book of Hebrews, we talked about the Day of Atonement and how Jesus entered beyond, he tore the veil in two and entered into the holy place into heaven, the holy of holies into heaven. That, this is a reference to that Day of Atonement there. He entered the presence behind the veil because he's a priest, a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. So, that's the argument. The argument is this. The Old Testament Aaronic priesthood disappears because Jesus is the only priest that we need and he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The Old Testament priests were of the order of Aaron. They were descendants of Aaron, but Jesus was not. Jesus was a descendant of Judah, a different tribe, David. We've never heard of a priest coming from the tribe of David. There never was one. So we got a different priest from a different tribe, and the Jews are scratching their heads saying, uh, how does this work? How can you have a priest from a different tribe other than Aaron? And so this chapter explains how that happens, why Jesus is our priest. It explains two things. Why Jesus is a better priest than Aaron, and why the law of Christ is better than the law of Moses. And so these two things are deeply intertwined, and you can't separate them because it was the law of Moses which brought about the laws relating to the priesthood. You get rid of one, you got to get rid of the other. And we'll talk about that as we go. On. So let's look at our first point today, verse 11 and 12. We're going to jump all the way to verse 11 and 12 of chapter 7. To say this, neither rituals nor rules can change your life. Verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest? So do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying the Levitical priesthood through the law, can't bring perfection. And our word for perfection is the word teleos, which means maturity or completeness, as good as a man can get before God. The, law, the Old Testament law can't bring that. So, let's read it again. If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, brother, the people received the law, what further need there was there for another priest? who should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is of necessity also a change of the law. So here's our first comparison. Perfection doesn't come through the priesthood and it doesn't come through the law. And uh, perfection or maturity or completion, that's our word. In fact, if you remember... Um, if you went back one whole chapter to chapter 6, it says, therefore, let us go on to, anybody remember what we studied at the beginning of chapter 6? We were all supposed to go on to maturity or perfection. That's the same word there. 
in Jesus Christ we can go on to maturity and perfection. And I mean perfection not by, abs I mean completion. We may complete whole, you know, in fact, uh, it tells us uh, in uh, Timothy, it says, uh, 1 Timothy chapter, uh, like say, 4, 9, 18 and 19 or something like that. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, that the man of God may be complete or perfect or mature. So the scripture does that. God's word changes us. The Old Testament law, the Old Testament priest could not do that. So can you imagine the scandal that this must have caused among the Hebrews? They were raised going to the temple. They were raised bringing the lamb. They were raised bringing the bulls and the goats. They were raised, you know, going to the Day of Atonement every year, the Passover every year, doing all these things. They were raised by, they, they revered the law of Moses. And here the writer of Hebrew completely undercuts their leg. He says, listen, all that's changed. Wow. Do you, you realize how hard that must have been for them? In fact, i got to tell you, that's hard for people today. People today, we got groups of people who say, back to the law, obey the law. And, you know, they only want to take it in and want to cherry pick what parts of the law they want to keep. And, and I have people telling me, you know, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. If Jesus Christ can't change, then the law can't change. I got news for you. This verse says, of necessity, there is a change of the law. How can that possibly be? If God's character never changes, how could there be a change of law? Well, I think that we got to understand what the law is about. You know, when you look at the Ten Commandments, we read them earlier. They're, they're great commandments. Aren't they great? Jesus, you know, God's, God's moral law. You suppose God's morality has changed since he, he wrote the Ten Commandments? No, not really. God's still the same. He's moral. Then why would his law change? Well, here's, let me explain to you why. First of all, the Old Testament law was a national law. It was Israel's law. It was just like we have the penal codes of today, and we got more laws, I think, than they ever thought to have. And it was their national law. That's how they ran their country. But you have to understand that a law isn't just the commandment. A law is tells you what you may or may not do. But a law also includes, and it's part of the law, includes the penalties alongside of that law. So, if you in the Old Testament gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, what was the penalty for the law? It was part of the law. Stoning, right? Anybody uh, here kindle the fire on Saturday? Would you raise your hand, Alan? You go camping every Saturday, don't you? No, not every Saturday. No, okay, not every Saturday. You know, oh, well, maybe we should take you out and stone you. <laughs> The consequences or the penalties are part of the law. So when Jesus Christ came, he changed the law. Did he change the idea that you shall have no other God before me? Nobody changed the penalty. Today we don't stone people who are in adultery. We don't stone people who, who do witchcraft. We don't stone homosexuals. We don't, st you know, we don't do that stuff. Why not? Because the law has changed. See, in the Old Testament, there was a penalty, and it was a human penalty, and God used it, you know, to show just how serious sin is. And if you sinned, you, you, paid, the, you paid the price, oftentimes with your blood. One chance and you're done. In the New Testament, there's also a penalty to be paid. In fact, I don't know if you know it, but almost all these commandments... All but one of the Ten Commandments is repeated in the New Testament in the law of Christ. The only one that's not repeated is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
because Jesus Christ rose on, on Sunday, and, and it, every day now is, is holy, and we worship on the Lord's Day. But so what happens today if you don't say, let's just say you worship other gods? You get stoned for that? Is that, is that the New Testament law? If you commit adultery, do you get stoned for that? Is that the New Testament law? What's the New Testament law? It is just as severe. I don't know if you knew this. The New Testament law is more severe than the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament, if you sinned, you got stoned. In the New Testament, if you sin, Jesus Christ gets crucified. The penalty is still paid. See how the law changed? The consequences are different now. They are more severe. Our sin resulted in the death of Christ. Wow. That's heavy. My sin hung in there. It was I who stood before the cross. I heard the crowd shouting, crucify him, and that voice was mine. My sin caused the blood to flow from his hands, his back, his head. That's the consequence of Christ's law in the New Testament. There's a change of law. Absolutely amazing. So here's the thing. Old Testament law, the rituals and the rules can't bring about a change of heart. So they can't bring perfection. That's the problem with the Old Testament law. New Testament, Jesus Christ's death on the cross and our repentance has the power to change your We see it happen, don't we? Have you seen it happen? I've seen it happen to me. I've seen it happen to other people. You're sitting here because Jesus Christ, I hope you're sitting here, because Jesus Christ has saved you and other people around you. This is the incredible truth of Hebrews chapter 7, 11 and 12. There's a change of law from the law of Moses to the law of Christ. There's a change of priesthood from the Aaronic priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood. And by the way, there's only one priest after the order of Melchizedek. Just Jesus. He's the only one. You don't need any more. So you can't go to some church where they have the Melchizedekian priesthood and become a priesthood a priest after the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't work that way. Only Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now let's jump down to verse 18 and 19. And we'll see this a little further, uh, where we're going to see neither rituals nor rules can fix what's broken in my heart. Verse 18. Listen to the strong words here. On the one hand, there's an annulling of the former commandment. That's a strong word. Annul, annulling, very strong word. Because of its weakness and unprofitableness for the law made nothing perfect, teleos, mature, complete. On the other hand, there's the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Pretty strong language. So uh, what's the word annulled mean? It means to uh, be abolished. The Hebrew would have been mortified that their law was abolished. You know, Jesus said in, in something interesting. He said, I came not to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. I thought you said he didn't come to destroy the law. He, he actually reiterated the law in the New Testament, most of it, so he didn't destroy it. What he did is he fulfilled it by dying in our place for our sins. That's what he did. He paid the penalty instead of us paying the penalty. So, strong language. Rituals and rules, this is why rituals and rules don't make you a better person because they don't change your heart. It tells us that in verse 18 and 19 that the law and the priesthood are powerless and unprofitable to help you reach maturity. And uh, let me just say this, lest you misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong 
with the Ten Commandments. There's nothing wrong with God's law. It, it, it's perfect. I'm not suggesting that we throw it out. Not at all. When God says, do not murder, I think that's probably a good idea, don't you? When God says, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> when God says, don't lie, kid, now who was that? Don't lie. When he says, don't steal, it's a good idea not to steal. I mean, these, these are not only good ideas, these are God's ideas, these are truth. Nothing wrong with the law. So why did God change it? Because the law, again, has one weakness. The law can tell you what to do, it can't make you want to do it. The law can tell you what is wrong, but the law can't stop you from wanting to do what's wrong. And that's our problem. That's why we need Jesus. Man, we need Jesus. I hope that you're right there sitting there saying, I need Jesus because I, I got these problems in my life. I want to do things that are wrong sometimes. I don't want to do things that are right sometimes. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. My parents tell me. My teachers tell me. My, my, the, the policeman tells me. The courts tell me. The, the church tells me. This is wrong. Don't do it. I just wish somebody would tell me how to fix that in me. Don't you? Well, look at Hebrew does. It says Jesus does that for you. Jesus can fix your broken heart. He fixes what's broken in your life. Let me just share a couple of verses. 1 Timothy 1.8 says the law is good if used lawfully. Romans 7.12 says the law is holy the commandment is holy and just and good. But then, Romans 8, 3 says, What the law could not do, in that it was weak through our flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. Galatians 3, 24 says, What's the purpose of the law? The law is our schoolmaster. To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So here's the key. The law, by the way, has a purpose for today. You know what the law is? The purpose of the law is this. is to make it to condemn us. You know, a lot of Christians don't want us to condemn other people. And I don't believe in condemning other people either. But I do believe in letting God's word do the job for me. You know what I'm saying? It, it does say... Don't commit adultery. And, and Jesus even went a little deeper, didn't he? He said, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So the law got a little tougher under Jesus. When it says don't steal, don't lie, don't do any of this, we all get convicted. We get cut to the heart and we say, yeah, I'm living in sin. Yeah, what of it? The purpose of the law is to make us feel guilty and to drive us to the feet of Jesus who can save us. That's the use, that's the proper use of the law today. I have no problem quoting the Ten Commandments to people and tell them they're breaking them. But I also have no problem in telling them that Jesus has paid the penalty for their sins. And they need it. Jesus. See, here's the thing. Jesus has the power to do the things that the law can't do. Jesus is able... Oh, here we go. Verse 25. Let's read it. Therefore, Jesus is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. I love that word uttermost, don't you? God doesn't save us part way. 
He doesn't like just take an arm or a leg or part of my head or part of my feet. He wants all of me. And so the law could not bring completion or perfection, but Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost. And you're saying, man, I wish Jesus would do that for me. I wish Jesus would do that for me. How does he do it? Now, this verse says, he saves us to the uttermost by the fact that right now Jesus is praying for you. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So, Dennis is down here preaching, and Dennis is a bad boy, okay? And Jesus knows Dennis is a bad boy. You know what Jesus does? He prays for me. Well, that's a little frightening, isn't it? Because if you pray for me, you don't have any idea what I've done. Jesus knows it all. And he prays specifically for my sin, that I would repent, trust him, place myself in his hand, so that he can do the transforming work in my life. Jesus is praying for you right now. He knows what's, what's, what you're doing wrong. He knows where your errors are. He knows where you've broken the law. He knows where you don't measure up. He knows where you've screwed up. You've messed it all. He knows. And he's praying specifically that you will relinquish yourself into his hands and say, yes, Lord, change me. Let's pray. Let's pray and let's ask God that he would take us and change us. Father, please take me. I repent of the idea that I could possibly, in my own self, by my own rules, by my own rituals, possibly ever change my life and become acceptable to you. I repent of that idea. Instead, I cast myself completely on you, the life changer. Please change me. I pray in Jesus' name.